morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Can we close that door at the back? Is that, is that possible? Thank you very much. Okay, my name is uh, Jonathan Hughes. I'm Vice Chair of the IUCN UK Peatland Programme. Um, and welcome to our workshop, which uh, uh, we've got a couple of hours to tell you uh, a bit about what we've been doing in the UK um, and give you a, an overview of what's happening um, in peatlands around the world. Uh, but also we've got a bit of a challenge for you uh, that will open things up to discussion and explore um, some of the key actions that we'd like to take forward for peatlands in the coming in the coming few years. Um, I'll say a little bit first of, first, first of all about who we are. We are um, a program under the auspices of the IECN in the UK um, and we've been operating for the last three years um, with the express purpose really of raising awareness of the plight of peatlands, uh, particularly in the UK but also in a global context. Um, and also trying to get policy, policy makers and practitioners to take effective action for people of restoration. Um, we've got um, various things to tell you in the next uh, 30 minutes or so and then we'll open things up for discussion. Um, first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, uh, people in a global global context. Um, but before I do that, just just to say that we are we, we have a range of material at the back there. There's a, a number of reports that we've produced over the years. Uh, there's a report on a, a commission of inquiry that we ran, which Cliff is going to tell you a little bit about later, uh, and also a publication on a, a set of case studies from best practice examples in the UK. So please do help yourselves to to those. Um, there's also some you, you may have noticed some of you. Eagle eyed, you may have noticed that there's some uh, whiskey at the back of the room as well. Um, if you manage to stay for two hours, you're allowed to take a, a, a free sample of whiskey. The reason why we've got whiskey is because of its link, it's, 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 its connection with Peatlands. The Scotch whiskey industry is very much dependent on water from, from Peatland catchments, and uh, many of you may have tried um, whiskies with a strong peat flavour in the past. Um, so that's a little free gift. Um, we, we, we've also got a, a little film to show you at the end of the, uh, of the two hours as well, um, which uh, hopefully you'll look forward to seeing. Um, okay, I'll, 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 I'll just give you a, a brief overview then of uh, pigments in a global context. Pigments are found in almost every country of the world. Um, there's just those, those few great countries there you can see where there isn't any pigments found. So. Uh, although they're very much a wetland ecosystem, um, they are actually found in every country of the world. Uh, and they cover around about 4 million kilometres squared globally. Obviously the northern countries there, Canada, and the Russian Federation, Sweden, Finland and Ireland are, are, are some of the richest countries in, 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 in peatlands. So if you think of, uh, if you look at the map of organic soils on, on Earth, uh, Peatlands actually only cover about 3% of the, of, of, of the land surface of the globe, but they can turn 30% of, of all soil organic carbon, so they're tremendous stores of carbon. <coughs> and drained and degraded peatlands, um, actually only 0.3% of the land surface where there's drained and degraded peatlands um, are extremely important for climate change emissions. They emit 6% um, of all anthropogenic carbon dioxide. So the hot spots there, which are identified on the map, you can see. So we've got Indonesia as a particular uh, problem area because of the, 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 the fires in the peat swamp forests. But we've also got peatland degradation in Europe. We've got some in Canada. And the Florida Ever Everglades is another hot spot for degradation. So these are the most important areas where action needs to be focused. And pigments, as I say, are found all over the world. They're, they're found in the, in the northern uh, tundra of Siberia. That's, that's in the Russian Federation. Uh, right down 
down to the tropics where you get uh, tropical peat swamp forests on, on, on deep peat. You find them in the mountains. Uh, this is in Kyr Kyrgyzstan. And right down to the sea, so you get coastal coastal peatlands as well. This this is the peatland. This is the peatland here. Actually, re re reminiscent. This this is this is in uh, the Russian Federation as well. It's actually reminiscent of uh, certain parts of the west coast of Scotland. So why are peatlands important? Why are we here today, telling you about peatlands? Um, the most important thing to say about peatlands is that in living peatlands, the production is actually larger than the decay. So therefore, the dead the dead plants, the dead material, the dead organic matter accumulates as peat over time and then it becomes a carbon, a carbon store. But they're also important for biodiversity. Uh, they have very specialist plants growing on them. This is, uh, well there's two types of sphagnum moss here. Um, and you may have seen on the banners outside there's a rather wonderful picture of a sundew uh, uh, having captured an ant which it's feeding on. These are carnivorous plants. Uh, because the nutrient regime in peatlands is very, very, um, it's, 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 it's very nutrient poor, uh, you tend to get very specialised carnivorous plants growing that have to supplement their uh, diet with a, sorry, my, my presentation is getting ahead of itself, um, have, they, they have to supplement their uh, nutrients through uh, uh, feed, feeding on insects. So peatlands are also important as a, as a historic archive. Uh, they contain um, the, the entire history of uh, the vegetation. This is, this is a, I think, a, a, a peat profile from the UK. So you can go back nine, eight, eight, nine thousand years and look at the whole vegetation history of, uh, uh, of that, of, of, that, of, of, of where, where the peatland is. So they're an incredibly important uh, paleoecological resource. But also you find um, some very interesting archaeological remains in peatlands as well, which can tell us a lot about uh, how people lived in the past. This is a, a, fam a famous bog body, as they're called down at the bottom there. Uh, peatlands are also important as a water regulator. If you look at this map, this is a, the, the shot of Google Earth. I should probably thank Google, because they are, are actually attending the conference. So uh, uh, you can see all these lines on this, on, on, on this uh, on this aerial image here, these are drains. So the, these are drains which have been put through the peat, the peat to take water off off the peatland, uh, and that has the effect of drying the peatland out. And without those drains, the peatlands can act uh, as a effectively a, a, a giant sponge within the landscape, which slows the uh, river flows down and can actually uh, help ameliorate floods. But peatlands are also important as a as an educational resource. Um, this is a couple of uh, the Scottish Wildlife Trust team in action, um, de demonstrating how not to do health and safety. And peatlands are also potentially, I'm going to put potentially in brackets there because uh, um, it's still, there's an unrealised potential. Uh, peatlands are a, are a nature-based solution to the climate change issue, and both in terms of mitigation, in terms, in terms of uh, peatlands are a stock of carbon and, and can sequester carbon. Um, from the atmosphere, but also in terms of adaptation for all those reasons that we've outlined. So, many peatlands are degraded, they, they look like this, and this is why we're using the, the term potential here, because um, peatlands in this kind of condition are actually um, not providing the functions that uh, we, we would hope that they would provide. So, um, this is very much um, about the role of peatlands as an ecosystem in climate mitigation, but uh, as I mentioned, it's very important that peatlands have a role in climate change and adaptation as well. The more resilient they are, um, the less likely they are to be damaged in the future. So we urgently need to step up restoration action. So I'll say something very briefly about the global threats and then I'll pass on to Clifton. So globally, degraded peatlands emit an absolutely huge amount of CO2, as I've already mentioned, around, around, around about the equivalent of 6% of global anthropogenic uh, climate change emissions. That, that, that equates to around about 2 gigatons of CO2 equivalents a, a year. Uh, that's a, an image of a, a peat swamp forest fire in Indonesia, where, where, where there's one of the hotspots of 
that, that's one of the hot spots of global peatland de degradation. Um, and in fact, Indonesia probably leads the list uh, of global top emitters. Um, and in, in the peatland world, at least, Indonesia is quite famous for the amount of carbon which is released from that, that particular ecosystem. Less known is actually the fact that the European Union is a good second. So in the European Union, around 80% of the carbon dioxide emissions from agricultural land um, actually come from peatlands. So peatlands are a, a, an incredibly important source of uh, emissions from agricultural land in, in the European Union. The main drivers of this uh, release of carbon from peatlands are drainage uh, for agriculture, this is in Kalimantan again on the peat swamp forests, uh, overgrazing, um, this is a, a peatland uh, in Tibet where you know the, the animals are pretty much the same wherever you, uh, 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 they, they may be different in different parts of the world but the effect of the animals is pretty much the same um, where, wherever peatlands are overgrazed and can cause damage. Um, they're also drained from forestry. Um, this is an example from Germany, but there are many examples from throughout the world. Um, and they're also afforested, so trees are planted on peatlands, which can uh, have the effect of drying out the peat and oxidizing it. And you often get these threats actually working in concert, so you, you can have multiple threats within one single landscape. Again, this is a, a Google image shot of Scotland, where you can see this being deforestation here on a large area of blanket peatland. Um, you have these drainage, uh, these, these, these erosion gullies here, which are partly formed because of overgrazing by wild deer. There's very, very high populations of wild deer in this area because there's no carnivores. Um, and there's some burning. These, this, this is burning for grass moorland. And you can see the, the classic drainage, drainage ditches as well going through the landscape. So the whole suite of different threats operating with, within this landscape, which is causing uh, people degradation and loss, and loss of carbon and loss of biodiversity. Um, peat extraction also continues in many parts of the world. Peat extraction for uh, for compost um, and in some parts of the world for, for fuel for burning in, in power stations. And absolutely colossal quantities of peat have already actually been lost. So this is a, a shop in Ukraine. Um, this was a peatland, a former 5,200 hectare large peatland in Ukraine, where after four decades of drainage and agriculture, there actually isn't any peat left. So the entire peatland ecosystem has been removed. Um, and this is this is quite a dramatic uh, picture. This is, this is from the UK, East Anglia. Um, at the top of the pole there, um, used to be where the, the land surface was, so that represents the loss of peat there. It's about five, six meters of peat, which is which is which which has disappeared over the years, um, thanks to drainage and conversion to agriculture. Um, there's also threats from inappropriately located wind farms. Um, this is a hot topic at the moment in the UK: uh, wind farms on peat, and whether by putting a wind farm actually on a deep peatland. Um, you actually you lose more carbon than you're actually gaining from the running of the, of the, of the wind farm for 20 to 30 years. And the, the message is really that we can't continue like this um, because things could get a lot worse under climate change scenarios. So if you, if you think we're going to get warming and we're going to get more um, severe weather um, patterns, then this could have a negative feedback loop uh, on peatlands. So we could actually see more and more emissions uh, arising from peatland degradation. So these, the, the, these are some uh, figures uh, showing the total technical possible future emissions. So you, so you can see that there's some absolutely staggering figures here, but 100,000 million tons of carbon dioxide a year, um, potentially from the uh, <coughs> in eastern, eastern Russia, and similarly Canada has a, a, a similar potential. But many countries in the world are facing, uh, 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 are facing this issue of uh, climate change exacerbating the already degraded peoples. So just, just to summarize some key stats, just to remind you uh, of what I've been saying, peoples cover around 3% of the global land area. 
Drained and degraded pollutants emit 6% of global anthropogenic CO2 emissions. That's almost as much as the aviation industry, if you, if you put it in that context. And in the European Union, around about 80% of land use emissions uh, come from degrading pigments. And a reminder of the key threats, and these are pretty universal in most parts of the world. Drainage being the big, biggest one. Burning, uh, and that's wildfires as well as deliberate burning. Um, overgrazing, um, uh, which is closely linked to the issue of erosion. Afforestation with commercial plantations on people. Peat cutting for fuel and compost. And energy generation, which is still a minor one, but it's a, a, a growing one. And as I said before, there's, there's the potential here for climate change negative feedback loops um, as the climate changes. So I've given you all the doom and gloom stuff. Now Clifton is going to give you some solutions and talk about uh, some of the things that we've been doing in the UK that we can share with you. Over to Clifton. <coughs> um, so the issue facing us is, is a huge one. There's, uh, there's been a long recognition that uh, peatlands are important for decades, several decades. Peatlands have been accepted as a major part of our climate change mitigation solution. If you look back at the legislation, you find that with the early work from Ramsar Convention, protecting wetlands, both for their biodiversity, their water value, but even then, in the early 70s, the recognition that peatlands were important for helping mitigate climate change was there. We then saw the um, Biodiversity Convention and uh, the, the, the UN Biodiversity Convention's new strategy for 2011-2020 identifies peatlands as, again, a, an important priority for biodiversity, but equally very important for climate change as a key role. And importantly, again, recognizing it's not just conserving the peat bogs, but restoring the damaged ones, because it's the damaged ones, as Johnny explained, that are releasing <coughs> the carbon into the atmosphere. And so that's now part of the, the, the HE targets uh, under the, the Biodiversity Convention. You also have the, the EU in the European area, you have the EU Habitats and Species Directive. Many of the, the peatland species and the habitats, the fens, the bogs, are protected as priorities under that directive and you have designated sites across the EU member countries aimed at protecting peatlands. Um, more recently, you've got the Kyoto Protocol, the main climate change legislation, specifically encouraging countries to protect carbon stores. Uh, and now, as a result of um, hard work done by Hans Houston and Wetlands International and others, we've seen that the Kyoto Protocol specifically encourages countries to account for the greenhouse gas emissions from damaged peatlands, but also to get the reward, if you like, of conserving carbon from going into the atmosphere through restoring peatlands. Restoring peatlands is a, is a fully accepted accounting activity now under the Kyoto Protocol. The problem we've got, though, is despite 30, 40 years of legislation aimed at protecting peatlands, we're not meeting the targets. When we originally does it by itself. <laughs> um, when we originally, when we originally uh, set about conserving peat bogs, much of the focus was on protecting designated sites and trying to prevent new threats. But that was in the face of a massive legacy of incentives and encouragement for agriculture, which meant that the peatlands were under a much greater force <coughs> to be drained. And as a result, what we now see is Still, less than 10% of the global peatland area is on the Ramsar protected list. Within countries under the, the U European Union, even though it's a high priority habitat for conservation, most of the peatland sites are in less than favorable status. So even with protected status, they're not managing to address the threats and problems of these damaged peatlands. Two years ago, there was a global assessment of peatlands carried out across the world, looking at the, the values of peatlands, and that report highlighted what was known about the ecosystem service benefits of peatlands. Again, as Johnny said, for water, for climate change, for biodiversity. 
And that led United Nations Environment Director Akram Steiner to say that the restoration of peatlands is a low-hanging fruit and among the most cost-effective options for mitigating climate change. It was something we could actually do. We technically have the ability to repair and restore the carbon sequestering function of a peatland and stopping it releasing carbon. And we now have, as I say, the climate change negotiations accepting peatland restoration as one of the tools in the toolkit. It's not instead of cutting emissions from <coughs> fossil fuels, it's an additional tool in the box. And if we're going to meet global targets to cut carbon emissions, we need that extra tool in the box. So how do peatlands help us in the climate change battle? Well, the first thing is, peatlands form in waterlogged areas. That's their sole driving force, is the, the high water levels of <coughs> water. And if they lose that water, there's many years of science has shown very clearly that as the water level lowers, 